Hey guys, I want to go ahead and um, as you start your uh, learning about calculus and limits, um, I want to go over a few things that I do with my students. So this is an example from last time. Sometimes when you know when you start off with limits, uh, the first thing you do is you want to evaluate them. So you plug in the value, right? You plug in a two here, and what you end up with is zero over zero. Well, that's indeterminate. You can't you can't solve it. You can't find it. So what you have to do is you have to change it up or modify this somehow. And one of the ways you do that is by factoring. So you notice here, this guy got factored into this. We can then simplify it out, and we're left now with a new limit. Limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 1. Now we can go ahead and plug it in, and 2 minus 1 is 1. So this guy gives you a limit of 1. Okay. Now the other thing, too, is when we evaluate it graphically, you got to understand when you're doing limits, you have to check both sides, the left and the right. In order for a limit to exist, you have to check it from the left side and from the right side. Now remember, limits, it's very important you understand it only approaches. It never gets there, it only approaches. So look at this one. The limit as x approaches negative 1. Here's negative 1 here, okay? So we got to look at it from the left side and from the right side. And you see, it. what is it approaching? It approaches a, this y value. What's this y value here? zero okay same thing the limit as x approaches zero of f of x this whole thing is f of x what is uh here's x equals zero what's the y value you see here uh, the left side and the right side what's that y value they're meeting at they're approaching it's approaching here at the y value of one what about part c the lim limit as x approaches three of f of x where's x equals three is right here okay if you notice, right, from the left and from the right, what is it approaching? It's approaching, what's this y value? 6. Okay. And what about f of 3? This is important because when you look at this, you have to understand it's at exactly x equals 3. What happens? Well, at x equals 3, there's nothing there. It's empty. It's missing. So what does that mean? That means the limit does not exist. Okay. Because there's nothing there. I'm sorry. The limit, yes, does exist, but f of 3 does not exist. So the limit is 6, right? It approaches 6. It approaches at x equal, at, as uh, x approaches 3, the y value is 6. But at this specific point, at x equals 3, what do we have? There's nothing there. So it does not exist. What about the limit as x approaches 8? Okay, at 8, what do you notice? Well, from the left side, it goes what? goes down to negative infinity. But from the right side, as we approach 8, what happens? It goes towards positive infinity, unbound. So, it does not exist. What about the limit as x approaches 12 of f of x? Again, here's 12. We've got to look at it from the left. From the left, it approaches what? What y value? 2. From the right, same thing. They both approach the same y value of 2. Okay? But if you take a look at it, what is f of 12? At x equals 12, what's the point? The value is what? 4. Okay? So, different from the limit and the actual value, f of 12. All right? Let's do a, a few more here. f of 1. What is f of 1? Remember, this is a point. At x equals 1, what's the y value? 2. Okay? It's 2. What about the limit as x approaches 1? So here's 1. So we got to look at it from the left and the right. From the left, it approaches the y value of 4. From the right, it approaches the y value of 1. See, they're both going to different places. So what happens? The limit doesn't exist. What about f of 5? Well, that's a point. At x equals 5, what happens? They both meet up at the same almost the same, right? It approaches the same y value, which is uh, 3, right here. And what happens at f of 5? There's a missing hole right there. Does not exist. Lastly, uh, limit as x approaches 0. What happens? Here is 0. We look at it from the left and from the right. What's it approaching? The same y value right there, which would be 3. Okay? So, in order for a limit to exist, um, they have to be approaching the same y value. So if f of x approaches different numbers from the right and from the left, it's not the limit is not going to exist. 
Also, if f of, f of x increases or decreases unbounded, meaning infinity, then it's also not going to exist, okay? You can see here the limit, the arrows go up. It's like approaching an asymptote. It's not going to exist. And the last one, when it oscillates, you know, sine of 1 over x, that's going to oscillate up and down at x equals 0, okay? Here, it's, it's never going to... It's going to continue to oscillate here, and it's never going to uh, bound to a certain value. So when it oscillates at a specific value, it doesn't exist. So keep those in mind as you're doing your limits, okay? A few more here. What's f of negative 2? Here's negative 2 here. Do we have anything there? No, there's no point right here. What about the limit as x approaches negative 2? But you see that little negative? It's from the left side. From the left, so from the left, as we get to negative 2, what's it doing? What's the y value doing? It's going to what? Negative infinity, okay? Um, or you can put d and e does not exist. What about f of 0? That's a point. At x equals 0, what's the point? 4, okay? What about the limit as x approaches 0? Okay, the limit as x approaches 0. So we have to do a look at it from the left and from the right. So from the left, there's really nothing there, is there? What about from the right? The right side of limit, it, what, it approaches 1, 2, 3, 4, right? But the left side of limit, there's, there's nothing there, okay? So it does not exist, okay? Because remember, the limit has to exist both sides, the left and the right. What about f of 2? f of 2, that's a point. What happens? Oh, there's nothing there, huh? Does not exist. The limit as x approaches 2, from the left, from the right, you see how they both approach the same y value right there? The y value is 1. Now remember, it's important to understand, it approaches it, it never gets there, it only approaches it. Okay? F of 4, that's a point. When x equals 4, what's the y value? 2. And the last one, x the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x. Okay, what happens? D and E, why? Because look at it. These are unbounded, right? What From the left is going up to infinity. From the right is going up to what? Infinity. So it does not exist. The limit doesn't exist. Okay. Now, these are some properties of... of uh, of limits that you guys should be able to understand. Uh, the scalar uh, property of limits says that if we have a, a constant here that's multiplying it, we can actually take that constant out, okay, and evaluate the limit and then use it to multiply it, okay? The sum and difference for the limits, uh, that means if we take the limit of two functions that you're adding, you can actually break it apart and take the limit individually. And these can go back and forth. Same thing with the product, okay? With the limit of a product, well, when you take the limit of two functions that are being multiplied, you can break them apart individually, do each individual limit, and then solve it. And sometimes that's useful because sometimes you have these complex limits, you want to break them apart to something much more e easier to do. And the last one with the quotient too, the limit of a quotient um, is equal to the, the quotient of each individual limit. So we would take the limit of this guy first, evaluate it, evaluate this limit by itself, and then we can go ahead and finally divide it, okay? And remember, as we're doing these limits, the easiest thing, right, the first thing, you just plug it in, right? You get plug in the 4. Well, let me go ahead and go over this one. You see how we're adding two functions here, f4x and the plus 1? So we can break it apart, you see here? And then you just plug it in. But in order to avoid this, all we got to do is just kind of plug it in, all right? But remember, the first rule in evaluating limits is just plug in your value. If you get something 0 over 0, it's indeterminate, then that's when you start changing things and trying to factor and whatnot. So here, when you see this, be careful because a lot of students think, oh, I got to factor first. No, you don't. Just plug it in, see what you get. In this case, we were able to get a value. See, you got negative 12 over 3. I can do that. That's pretty easy. And then so you got a numeric value, so that's not too bad. Okay, but now when we get over here, you plug in the 5, if you plug in 5 to the top and the bottom, you're going to get 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. So what do you do? You factor the top here, okay, this simplifies out, you have a new limit, then you plug in the 5 and you get 7, okay? Same thing here, 
And I remember, you have to be pretty good. This is factoring cubics. So uh, x cubed minus 64 is the same thing as x cubed minus 4 cubed. And so this is your a minus b, x minus 4. You already used one of the x's, so it's going to be x squared. The minus, then it becomes a plus. Put these two together, 4x. And then the last one's always a plus. And then you just take 4 squared, and that's 16. These are going to simplify out. You have a new limit. Plug it in, and you end up with 48. So not too bad. If you notice the next one, too, right, what do you do? You plug in the 0, you end up with indeterminate, 0 over 0. So what do you do? Expand it, okay? And you should be able to multiply this out, 3 plus x times 3 plus, times 3 plus x. And you end up with this. This is able to cancel out beautifully. What do you notice? 6x plus x squared over x. We plug in a 0, we're still going to get 0 over 0, so it doesn't help us out. But what we, we can do is we can factor out an x. So these simplify out. You're left with a new limit here. Plug in the 0, and you got your 6. Okay? And then if you notice, uh, a lot of times you're going to have to rationalize these. Okay? You got the limit as x approaches 0. If you plug in 0 here, you're going to get indeterminate form. So what do you do? You have to rationalize it. So what does that mean? Well, you want to get rid of these radicals. So what you do is you multiply by the the conjugate. So instead, you put square root of 6 plus x. Remember, you cannot change anything that's underneath the radical because that'll change the value. But what you can do is change the outside here instead of a minus into a plus and then keep the same square root of 6. Okay, so you're going to multiply by the conjugate to simplify out the radicals. Remember, you have to do the top and the bottom. So I just kind of expanded it right here. Okay, so if you notice square root of this times square root of this, that's going to cancel each other out. You're going to end up with 6 plus x. And then this guy times this guy, you're going to get positive so radical 6 times this. And then minus radical 6 times this, you're going to get minus radical 6 times square root of 6 plus x. And you notice these are going to cancel out, which is beautiful. That's what we want. Square root of 6 times square root of 6, negative square root of 36. Factor, uh, take the square root, you get a minus 6 and you're left with just the x, which is nice. Okay, so all of that gives you the top, all right? So hopefully you were able to follow that along. It's uh, pretty straightforward. So on the top you have x, on the bottom we have x times this expression here, but you notice they're gonna simplify out, which is nice. So be careful, okay? You're left with a one on the top. So you have one over square root of six plus x plus radical six. So now we plug in our 0, we, uh, we end up with square root of 6 plus square root of 6. Now be careful, this is not square root of 12, okay? This is 2 radical 6. And then this is it. I think your professor might uh, allow you to leave it like this. Uh, you might have to rationalize it, but I know for the AP exam, I think you can leave it like that. All right, guys? Let's do some transcendental functions. All right? What do you do? Just plug it in. Sine of 0. What's sine of 0? Okay, remember your unit circle here from pre-cal in uh, maybe Algebra 2? Remember, the first coordinate is your cosine, the second one is sine. So sine of 0 degrees right here is this guy right here, sine. So the answer is 0. What about uh, the limit as x approaches 2? Just plug it in. What do you get? 2 plus ln of 2. And you would just leave it like that. Um, professor would be acceptable with that. Next, x the limit as x approaches pi of x times cosine of x. Well, what happens? We plug them in, right? And do you know the cosine of pi? Yes, you do. Cosine of pi is right there. Cosine of pi is what? Negative 1. So then we have pi times negative 1. And you end up with negative pi. All right? The next one, limit as x approaches 0 of tangent of x over x squared plus 1. Tangent of 0, so we go over here. Now remember, this is sine and this is cosine. Remember that tangent is sine over cosine. Okay, the definition of tangent is sine over cosine. So that's sine and that's cosine. So 0 divided by 1 is 0. Okay, right there. And then the denominator is 0 squared plus 1. Is this okay? Is this legal? Yes, it is. 0 divided by 1 is 0. Okay, you can do that one. What about the next one with the e? Limit as x approaches negative 1, x times e to the x. What do you do? Plug it in. Plug in your values. This is pretty simple, straightforward. Now, 
your professor, you can either probably leave it like this or remember that the negative exponent makes it do the reciprocal. So either one of these two forms should be acceptable. Um, the next one, I like it because uh, you have to use a power rule. So you plug in your E, so you get E cubed, but remember your power rule with a logarithm. When you have a logarithm with an exponent, you can bring this guy to the front. So now you have 3 times ln of E. And remember, ln of E is 1. So 3 times 1 will give you 3. All right. And one last one that I want to do here, uh, or actually a couple more, uh, is the composite, uh, not the composite, I'm sorry, the complex fraction, a fraction on top of a fraction. Okay. So I want to get rid of this fraction because if you plug in 0, you're going to end up with 0 over 0 indeterminate. So you want to rearrange it. So one of the things you can do is get rid of these fractions. So how do you do that? Well, I got to get rid of x plus 2 and 2. So you're going to multiply that and use it as your least common denominator. So you're going to multiply it by 2 and x plus 2. But don't forget you also have to do the bottom. So when you cross, I'm sorry, when you multiply, you distribute this whole thing over here. The x plus 2 cancels out. You're just left with 2. And over here, the 2s cancel out, and you're left with x plus 2. But be careful because you have that minus in front. So you have that minus, so you got to put this in parentheses because you have to distribute this negative. Okay, so you distribute this negative, you get 2 minus x minus 2 over here. And then here on the bottom, you just have 2 times x times x plus 2. You don't want to distribute because you're hoping that something cancels out, something simplifies out so you can uh, evaluate the limit. So 2 minus 2 is 0, so you're left with negative x. And you see here the 2x, the x on the outside, this simplifies out, so you're left with negative 1 on the top. And then you have the 2 and the x plus 2 on the bottom. Now, you can go ahead and what? Plug in your zero, you end up with negative one-fourth. Okay, guys? And then uh, I want you guys to do uh, take a look at some composite functions, okay? Composite functions. So you notice this is g of f of x. And notice that the f is inside the g. So I'm going to take this guy, plug him in right in there and then take the limit. And this is pretty simple because you can just go ahead and plug them in, okay? One plus seven is eight, eight squared, and 64 minus one is uh, 63. And that's it, that's it. The other way you can do it is uh, take the limits of each one, but that would be, just be too long. Okay, so you can do the composite first and then evaluate the limit. Same thing over here. You see the f is inside of the g. You got two functions, f of x and then g of x. So the f is inside of the g. So this whole thing is going to go right in there. So you notice we have it there, and then the plus 3. And then 4 plus 3 is the 7. And all of this now. And now we can evaluate the limit, plug it in, and we end up with 18 minus 9 plus 7. And that's going to give us a cubit of 16, and you can leave it like that. All right? Uh, the last thing that I like to show my students is uh, as we're learning, uh, gearing up towards derivatives, you have this expression here. How would you, how would you solve this, right? Because if you plug in 0, you end up with 0 over 0. So you're going to have to evaluate this, expand it. So multiply this out, x. So this becomes x squared plus 2x delta x time plus delta x squared. Distribute the 2 over here, okay? So you're going to end up with this, 2x squared plus 4x delta x plus 2 times delta x squared, and then minus the 2x squared. And you notice that the 2x squares are going to simplify out right there. So you're left with this right here. But what you notice, they all have a delta x. So you can factor out a delta x here. You're left with 4x plus 2 delta x. These delta x simplify out. So now you have a new limit that you can evaluate. Now, be careful when you get to here. Remember, this is delta x. That's x. It's, it's different. So you're going to plug in the delta x only into, the, into here. And that becomes a 0. And then you, you're left with 4. And you should be 4x. Sorry. There it is. OK? So hopefully that's helpful, guys. Um, nothing too complex, too difficult. But I'll see you guys next time.